Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Brightworks, another episode of Beyond All Reason. After taking a couple looks at some lower OS games and seeing how some of those crazy matches can go, I feel like it's important to remind ourselves just exactly what pro-level gameplay can look like. So today, spawning on the northern section of Angel Crossing and representing the red team, a commander that goes by the name of Kung Fu Panda. Spawning as a Cortex commander here, going into those metal extractors, getting that bot lab up and running and starting with those wind turbines. You know, one of the settings we turn on all the time in the stream is upping the energy up to 3000. I really feel like that should be implemented into the game just because of the fact that it allows you to get your lab up without having to go for these wind turbines first. It saves an extra 30 seconds, but across every game that's played, well, anyway, spawning across the map right here, representing the blue team here, and ooh, communisming out, communisming? Just invented a new word right there. To communism, one's lab with another. Uh, I will conquer, and the blue team leader, Kuchi, gonna both be working on a bot lab here. Uh, both representing the uh, blue team here as Cortex, so should be good, good stuff. Now, coming in at 44 true skill there for Kuchi, 46 for Kung Fu Panda. Over a thousand hours played as well. This is definitely going to be a high experience match. So should be curious to see what's going to happen. So as far as Angel Crossing goes, usually this is the part where I give a little overview of the map and just kind of some of the interesting features. Uh, Angel Crossing is chock full of them. There's a lot of weird lanes that you can take. There's a big path right here where all of this is connected and you can go up this hill. You can go down in this direction. You can come up in this direction. Uh, you can come down in this direction into the back line right here. I mean, there's there's pathways everywhere on this map, so it's really, really complicated. Uh, but certainly all these commanders are very well familiar with some of these pathways, so we shouldn't see any unexpected run-bys, uh, at least not uh, not ones that the, the teams aren't aware of for lack of map knowledge here. It's not to say that run-bys aren't to be expected. Certainly a, a uh, important part of the game, whether you're playing in a pro lobby or a regular lobby. There's also this 5.3 metal extractor right here, accompanied by some 2.9s. Going to be lovely to whichever commander manages to hold on to that. It's going to be a tremendous bonus uh, at the at the early game at the very least. Heading into the mid game, oftentimes that can become a little bit less of a issue if you uh, can't contest that metal extractor. But over time, it ends up being a couple hundred, couple hundred to maybe even a couple thousand metal, depending on how long you can hold that uh, metal extractor there. We do have a couple of blitzes moving across right here for Kronar. Going to be uh, holding the blue team up from the very bottom here, sending some of those blitzes across. They passed by in the night as Seamless as two ships. Uh, Gof's little bot right here. Not actually finding anything right now. So Gof not pushing very aggressively right here. Sometimes uh, what we see is commanders will push extremely aggressively up to the middle of the map right here. Uh, sort of like what Kuchi is doing right here, where you can see the blue commander is stepping extremely far forward here. Uh, relative to the units that are available anyways. Nice call outs right here. Ural pinging to make sure that Kronar is aware of this grunt that's headed into the base. The grunt, however, going to turn around and micro back, realizing there's no way to get up into that base with the commander standing in the pathway and blocking the entrance here. So going to try and find a way into the base right now for Zydka. Zydka deflecting this though with a couple of rocketeers firing away, trying to deflect that bad boy. The LOT over here is a little more menacing. Resbots. Oh, okay. We pick off a single resbot right there. That's quite nice. Oh, and another one goes down. All right, two resbots for a grunt. Definitely well worth it here. The grunt being 36 metal and those resbots each being about 100 apiece. Yeah, definitely a nice little trade right there. Even if we lose the grunt here, I'm going to get a metal exchanger as well. So that's quite nice. All right, yeah, definitely some great early game aggression from Gof. Very, very nicely done. Gig Angel. Giga, Giga Angel? We'll, we'll go with the Gig Angel. <laughs> Our maroon player here. Gonna be stepping into the water. No naval lab, but just going to be uh, moving underwater to try and capture some of those metal extractors. There's some hovercraft that have been built right here by Wild Sparrow. Going to be the uh, bottom of the red team's barrel. Trying to move some of these hovercraft across and uh, keeping them in a decent formation here. Two of them is definitely enough to thwart some of the uh, lesser, lesser units out here. The pawns, the grunts, the ticks, that sort of thing. Uh, but aside from that, they're not going to stand up to basically anything else out of the T1 catalog. Kronor and Kuchi now pushing up pretty far forward here. Now Kung Fu Panda and Go for both doing the same thing, trying to move their commanders forward here. The timing uh, felt like it was a little bit slower than I expected, but overall, still not the end of the world. We're setting up a beamer turret back here, and I actually quite like it. I think it's probably a good idea to set up a little bit of a contingent point, a little fallback area where you can uh, retreat your troops to for some guaranteed safety. Setting up that beamer turret definitely guarantees that. It also means that should units run around from this angle, like some of these grunts could very well do. Yeah, they're going to have a slightly harder time flanking in this direction here. Oh, nice deacon right there by Ural. Ah, uh, Constructor in a lot of trouble. Oh, it's real close, but the Constructor does stay alive with the help of one of the other commanders over here, Dunna, doing an excellent job with those pawns and making sure that that commander stays alive. Very, very nicely done. 
excellent bit of teamwork right there, saving his teammate, making sure that uh, all is well over here on this little island choke point over on that side. Meanwhile, Victor12 has absolutely no contest on his island. Yeah, this entire area is completely uncontested right now, meaning the Tan Commander has all the uh, room in the world right now to continue expanding, continue sending little runbys, continue pressuring a polygon over here on the right-hand side. I will conquer an A-Polygon, both going up against, uh, well, two commanders apiece, so they're going to be going up against Scrooge and Wild Sparrow. Means that, at the very least, all is balanced in the world. Perfectly balanced, as all things should be. Rocketeer is firing away from long range over here, trying to melt down that uh, T1 LLT that Kung Fu Panda is setting up here. Kung Fu Panda did manage to claim that 5.3 metal extractor, so it's quite nice. Going to be giving a nice little metal advantage, at least for the time being, to the red commander. Little bit of a commander trade over on the left-hand side as well. As the smoke clears. Was that not a trade? Oh my goodness, that wasn't a trade. Wow, okay, that wasn't a trade at all. I thought that was absolutely a trade right there. That was actually just the Maroon Commander going down right now. All that metal is going to go back to Dunna. Yeah, Dunna with 8% HP, but actually manages to, uh, yeah, take out the Commander, and that means that the water lane is going to be really difficult to contest at this point. Dunna needs to get into some hovercraft or maybe even straight into boats. I wouldn't even mind it. Just start plopping down a boat lab somewhere around here. Just start making some of those ships. Hovercraft is going to be a little more useful later into the game after we've won the water completely. But hovercraft, uh, or sorry, but naval craft are going to be uh, a little bit sturdier, easier to uh, win win the battle with. Missing some metal extractors over here for Zyka. Forces over here for uh, Victor 12. Ooh, nice catch right there. A polygon in position to degun down some hovercraft over here. Yeah, the uh, Victor 12 thugs are trying to move forward. Sounds like a gang. Victor 12 thugs. <laughs> gonna be moving forward, trying to snipe I Will Conqueror's commander right here. They're gonna run into the LLTs, and that water is definitely slowing them down quite a lot. You can see they're being... Uh, yeah, they're ha well, they're having a lot of movement issues right now. Trying to storm the beaches, but finding it very difficult to move their servos and gears with the uh, water clogging up all their ports. Riot tank out on the front lines right here. Built by the orange commander, but protecting the red. Uh, a little far forward, though. Yeah. Rocketeer is definitely the threat to those, uh, those, those pounder tanks, just because of the fact that they can outrange them so consistently. This is a nice little joint force right here, though. We have tons and tons of commanders contributing on the front right now. If we zoom out to see the colors, we can see uh, Kuchi getting in on the action, as well as Zydka, as well as Kronar. All three commanders contributing to this frontline push right here. Victor-12 cloaking the commander and moving it forward, trying to be a hero. Oh, yeah, it's tricky. Not enough economy yet to cloak and move at the same time. Takes a thousand energy per second, so you really gotta have basically a T2 economy. You can do it on T1, but it takes a, a ridiculous amount of T1 in order to actually have the economy for that, so... Uh, Victor-12 gonna be forced to retreat off the front lines here. I think probably just deterring the blue forces here with the threat of a comm bomb, but not actually able to connect a big one. Everywhere I look, it looks like the blue team is lining up perfectly against the red. They've got exactly the right amount of people. There's no uneven fights here. And in fact, they've even got a 2v3 essentially over on this side. The one thing is over on this right-hand side, you can see that Victor 12's forces are actually applying pressure over here with Screwish uh, alongside Wild Sparrow. But Sparrow doesn't have any more units out on the field at this point. He's got a couple hovercraft making their way around, maybe thinking about flanking right now. Uh, but yeah, so right now it's actually a disadvantage for the red team. There's effectively one more player playing on the front lines here for the blue team than on the red team. Can't really afford to have anybody in the back line ecoing right here. We do have an air player, Monkey RTS for sure, uh, going to be the air player here for the uh, blue team. Uh, we do have tech right now though for the yellow team. So a little bit of a different uh, type of type of strategy or change of strategy. Blue team going for a aerial advantage as well as a... Ooh, Speaking of aerial advantage, tons of uncontested bombers over here. There's no fighters whatsoever for the red teams. So these bombers have complete control over this side of the map. Going to be dropping their bombs on the precious, delicate eco right here for Victor 12. Uh, whereas the red team went for tech advantage. So eventually the economy is going to outscale the blue team. But what does it matter if there's no economy to get to that T2 economy in the first place? Boom, go the energy or the energy extractors. Or energy converters. There we go. Getting ahead of myself in the talking right now. The bombers are continuing to push forward. Commander goes down right here to the onslaught of forces. These bombers are coming up over the hills and into the base of the red player, Kung Fu Panda, who's going to lose all of his T1 economy. This is a desperate time to lose the T1 economy because it means that T2 constructor is never going to hit the field. Production, uh, unit production is nowhere to be seen right now for the red commander because all of his eco just went down. And he's gone for the T2 lab and he can't get the T2 constructor out of the lab in time. Red commander goes down. The blue forces are sweeping through. That's a massive massive victory on the front line right here for the blue team and it's going to take a act of brilliance right now to bring down the blue that is pushing forward into the heart of the red team 
so much metal right now going back towards the blue team right now. Zydka eating up a commander wreckage, feasting on the corpse of his brethren. Very nicely done. Going to be providing tons and tons of metal. We do have a little hovercraft run by that did a decent amount of damage. Took out some metal extractors, took out some uh, wind turbines over in the back lanes over here. Still a single hovercraft remains, but definitely nowhere near as powerful as those bombers have done to eradicate a whole bunch of the economy right now for the red team. Starting up those advanced metal extractors, starting up more wind turbines, desperately, desperately needing more and more energy. Shuriken are actually sent to the front line again, using that air power to actually shut down a whole bunch of these units right here, and some hounds are going to be caught. Yeah, there's nothing they can do. Hounds without power. Finally reboot. They cycle their power, and it's going to mean that they're right in front of a whole bunch of medium tanks firing at them. Never a comfortable place to be. Looks like the hot pink commander transitioned into air to try and save his team. It's going to be screwish trying to, uh, yeah, at the very least provide some aerial relief from any more bombers that are coming out. But it looks like Monkey RTS for sure has transitioned away from that. Ready to just go into fighter production here. Getting those shuriken out to prevent any of these T2 units from being tremendously effective on the front line. And I absolutely love it. The shuriken are going to be so useful here because it means that even though those T2 units are so powerful against T1, they're not powerful. They're EMP'd. Shut those units off and there's going to be absolutely nothing left for the uh, red team to push forward with. Tan reinforcements have been pulled from over on the right-hand side. These thugs are going to be going up against three different armies right now. A perfect time for a T2 transition as well, might I say. The uh, blue player goes up to T2 here. We have a spy bot out, so that's quite nice. Going to be able to paralyze any big groups of uh, maybe those T2 units that come out here. Excellent trade right there, though. The shuriken catch all of the thugs, and there's no anti-air available right now. Some comes up here from the commander, Victor 12, but it's just not, not enough, not quick enough. And down go a whole bunch of those thugs. A brutally efficient trade right there. All that T1 getting way more value than I think the red team bargained that it would be able to. They were really banking on this T2 transition to really wipe away all the T1 that was pushing forward right now, but it's just not the case. The blue team holding on tooth and nail, fighting to the very last right now, using these T1 tremendously well, using the T1 against the T1 to make sure that they at the very least have a method of uh, yeah keeping, keeping the trades efficient. Post abandoned. It's true. Does Scrooge recognize that? Doesn't look like it. Scrooge mostly just focused on the uh, air defense right now. Those bombing runs were killer, and we can't afford to take any more damage right now. The red team's still holding on, and uh, it's impressive that they're even holding against this so far. Three commanders up on the front. They've got to be so careful. Uh, uh oh, those hounds are pushing forward, and you got to be careful about those. Spybot up here providing reliable uh, information about exactly where all the units are. Love to see that. Oh, missile trucks up and over the hills right here are firing away now. This is so brutal. Those missile trucks do so much damage. Victor 12, de-gunning down some of those rocketeers that pushed a little too aggressively. A whole bunch of blitzes being sent across, though. Love this blitz push right here. Definitely catching Victor 12. Just a step out of position right now. EMP on a lot of those hounds as well. Shuts them off. Going to uh, delay that hound push quite a bit right here. Oh, nice D-gun right there by Victor 12, though. Cleaves away tons and tons of those blitzes. You know what? That was a crazy efficient D-gun. Victor 12 actually cleaning up the vast majority of those forces really, really nicely right there. Excellently done by the Tan Commander. Keeping his lane nice and secure. Very, very good to see. Looks like we have some Arbiters up in the mix. We also have some Scorpion turrets firing away at whatever they can. Gonna try and catch any of those, uh, yeah, any of those pesky T2 hounds. Hounds are uh, sort of weird in this scenario because they they effectively counter the scorpion turret, but only if you have the vision and the range for it. Uh, they don't counter it if you don't have radar detection and maybe even a spy bot or something like that. So would love to see Oral Annie Zykus producing a, uh, a spy bot or two. Uh, T1 hovercraft going up against those T2 bot hovercrafts. Yeah, it's a cheeky matchup. Not one we see all too often here, but Dunna doing a great job of deflecting all these hovercraft that are being spammed out by the Maroon Commander and actually shutting down that push quite nicely right there. Yeah, nicely done. An excellent choice to go for those hovercraft uh, platypus over here. Hadn't even thought about that, but that's a great, great move right there. Going to mean that also this uh, title, sorry, not title, this uh, jellyfish coastal torpedo launcher is not going to have any effect. Can't shoot at hovercrafts with uh, torpedoes. Oh, well, okay, there we go. Down it goes. Gonna mean that these Rocketeers, uh, Aggravators rather, Cortex Rocketeers, can push on forward right here. They'll be great. Platypus still running into the back line here as well. And it's just T1 Hovercraft available for Gig Angel, so I'm not sure. Uh, in fact, I am pretty sure that it's not gonna be enough to hold the lines against all of these. Uh, you know what? That being said, those tanks are pretty sturdy. They're hover tanks, so they're a little less sturdy than the regular tanks, uh, but even so. They still have quite a bit of HP, and those uh, light lasers on those platypus don't exactly compel too much damage out of their forward nozzle. 
hounds and gunslingers pushing over on this side. They do catch a whole bunch of these uh, rocket hovercraft over here, the Mangano. Apparently a uh, medieval siege weapon, as I've been educated on by the lovely viewers like you. Thank you. There we go. Gunslinger gets in the back line. Gets paralyzed. Triggers an all-out aerial warfare. A clash of the fighters right here is the... Yeah, green and pink fighters collide with one another. Gunslinger's still in the back, though, trying to uh, do some damage over here. Doing a decent job of it. Will it pop the lab? It does indeed. The lab explosion brings the gunslinger down. But I think that's a nice little hit right there. Shuts down production, at least for the time being, of the Tan Commander. And now there's a whole bunch of these... Ooh, a whole bunch of shell shockers moving forward. Victor 12 steps forward, cleaves apart the shell shockers right there with a massive D gun, wiping away once again a tremendous portion of the army right there for Kronar. Kronar having such a tough time trying to get up that ramp right there. Basically, no units are able to. What a tricky match. The red team stabilizing after all this. You can see the play right here for Kung Fu Panda. Uh, realizing he lost so much economy is just to go into a whole bunch of greed. Just trying to eco as hard as humanly possible and make sure that every single penny goes into scaling as fast as possible. And then hoping that with that scaling comes a little bit of a comeback right now. It's going to be tricky though. This metal extractor producing 21 metal per second. Basically what you'd get out of an Aphis. If you're... Well, it's, it's half of what you'd get out of an Aphis. Uh, I believe, yeah, you, about 40 metal per second or so. Uh, commander goes down right there. I think it was actually friendly fire. I think the scorpions were trying to kill the ticks, and they actually ended up killing the commander. Uh, not the end of the world, but certainly an efficient snipe right there. Killing a commander with ticks feels like just about the most efficient way that you could ever kill a commander. A polygon hanging out over on this left-hand side uh, of this this little terrain over here, hanging out on the shoreline, trying to fight against Scrooge over here. Scrooge with a nice little camera, so does see the cyan commander here hanging out on the beach. What a nicely placed command or uh, camera right there. Yeah, it's actually really, really nice. A T2 naval lab is coming up right now. This was not a transition I saw uh, coming up, but I suppose it's worth it. You get those T2 underwater metal extractors out of it, which is always nice if we go into a constructor. You can also get uh, those missile ships, which can reach out and hit pretty hard. I'm not sure anything else is going to be all too efficient right here, so I'm... Okay, we're going for Buccaneers. I stand corrected. I thought for sure we were going to be going for... Uh, something like, you know, some of those some of those ships that could actually do a little bit of damage off to the shoreline, but I guess not going to be the case here. And just like that, we've settled. All is calm in the world. There are some rocket spiders building over here. The blue team definitely amassing forces for another attack. The red team just building up forces as well. T3 gantry has been thrown together right now. Advanced geothermal essentially powering all of it. There's a whole bunch of wind turbines here. Do we have any fusions? No. Okay, this is just wind power and uh, wind power and geothermals, and I guess at 23 wind speed right now. My goodness, I hadn't realized how good wind speed is on this map. But yeah, with 23 wind speed, you can pretty much go up to a T3 economy with, uh, yeah, just wind plays, I suppose. T3 lab coming up for Coochie as well. Must be smelling that there's marauders out and about on the map. These marauders are not built in tremendous mass. There's only three of them out so far, and two of them are already uh, getting ready to head across the map. But man, they can do some damage if they find a weak spot here in the blue team. A lot of sprinters over here, but other than that, not really a compelling defense. So that's definitely a vulnerability those marauders could exploit. There's also a couple of Webbers coming up with some of the recluses, so that's cute. I always love the Webbers. I think they're one of my favorite units of all time. We do have a Karganeth that's been built and has already been handed over to Ural. Apparently the plan is to send it up and over this mountain, but the recluses are going to pull the trigger early. They're going to go across and try and snipe whatever they can. In this case, it'll be a T2 constructor right there. Nicely done. Catching a constructor always feels like a very efficient trade. I suppose it is always a very efficient trade. Not really any loss to killing a constructor. They don't really fight back. At least not well. Here come the rocket spiders. Only reason this trade is efficient is because those uh, fiends are grouped up quite nicely here. Well, the spiders are trying to climb up the hill to safety. <laughs> Fiends are burning them back pretty good, though. Yeah, only about three of them are going to make it up to this hill and actually be able to fire over here. Not enough to really do any damage. Another one goes down right here. It was an excellent attempt, but just barely not enough firepower right there. The fiends basically cleaning all that up quite nicely. This is good, though. The rocket spider's up on top of the hill, actually firing down on some of these units over here. A little bit of a complicated battle trying to uh, navigate the terrains like that. A nice deflection right there from the red team. The hounds were pulled off the front line, though, so if there was a time to send all the fast and cheap units forward, it would be exactly right now. 
Those hounds are way out of position. If any push went through the middle of the map right now from the blue team, it would completely ravage them. Another big push. We have, um, oh, there we go. Yeah, we do have some of those missile boats firing away wherever they can. Absolutely denying the geothermal over here, but also trying to pop some of the metal extractors and whatever else. Webbers and recluses over on this side of the mountain holding the line. Does the red team see these? They, well, they do now. <laughs> they do now. All those spiders do finally push forward. Let me go ahead and clear the screen here for clearer view. And there we go. The Webbers and the Recluses marching on into this base, wiping away a tremendous amount of this force. Oh, and there goes the T2 lab as well. The Webbers are so powerful when mixed in with these Recluses because it makes those Recluses so much more accurate. Absolutely love that we sent all of those in together. Obviously means we can also reclaim some of this. Yeah, there we go. Recycling some of the forces that otherwise would have been uh, just dead meat on the other side of the map right here. Beautifully done. Tactical missile launcher firing away whenever it can. Shiva marching across the map right here. Did those Marauders ever make it ashore? They did. Okay, big Marauder push over here. Sniffed out that it was about time to send those across. And this is quite a few of them. We do have eight Marauder in total here. Those Sprinters are going to be melted away for sure. Platypus not going to stand much of a chance either here. Looks like beautiful splits right here. Coochie is in position though. It's going to be, it's going to have to be Killer Degans. Gets three of them. Oh, the fourth one manages to get away. It's going to slip back into this stream over here. No commander to protect this base right here for a polygon. So it's going to be the death of the Cyan commander here as all of these marauders get into the back line and pop all of the energy converters, metal extractors, productions, geothermals, and just about everything else that the Cyan commander has. Oh, nice micro right there. Oh, oh, oh. Excellent splits right there. Absolutely beautiful. Oral Zykus does manage to split up the Marauders here, only losing a single Marauder to the, uh, yeah, geothermal explosion right there. Sends in some Shuriken to try and paralyze some of them. Only catches one of them, though. The rest of these Marauders are going to head in, uh, fellas? There we go. <laughs> they were supposed to head over here, but I guess there's technically a full wall off. They can't, they can't push in this direction, so they thought they had to go all the way around. Uh, either way, not going to be too tremendous of an issue. D-Gun is launched by Marky, Monkey RTS for sure. Gets two of them. Ooh, not going to get a third, though. Gunship's up in the air. Sprinter's trying as well. Commander does cloak, making it tricky for those Marauder to pinpoint where exactly they can harass at. Meanwhile, full-blown T3 up on the fronts as well. We have Shiva and Razorback coming out right now. Rocket Spiders are still pushing in. We have the Karganeth blasting away at whatever it can over here, climbing up and over the hills. Uh, these Marauders are retreating backwards at this point. I think retreating is probably the best option. Coochie's commander is still lingering over here. Oh, does he notice, though? Oh, Coochie. Oh, he does come back just in the nick of time. Manages to degun down those Marauders, and that will be the Marauder push held. Definitely not enough damage to justify all those Marauders. Uh, that is going to mean that the front line collapses right here, and now we have a bot spam coming out. Tons and whoops, tons and tons of grunts coming out all over the place and pushing into this line right here. There's not enough to deal with this spam. We have pit bulls, we have a LLT, but it all goes down here. Pitbull definitely not fast enough firing to handle all of this overflow of T1 units. And just like that, a whole bunch of T1 pushes directly into the main base of the Maroon Commander. They're all going to start moving towards the yellow as well. The Rocket Spider is still being a nuisance in the back line. All the metal extractors have gone down, and it looks like with that push and the failure of the Marauders to kill the blue team, the blue team will indeed snatch victory today in this match of beyond all reason. What a fun one. Really thought the red team was uh, dead there in the mid-game, mid but they actually managed to claw themselves back, put themselves in a position, and give it their all, and I absolutely love a game like that. Anyway, let me know what you thought about this game down in the comments below. If I missed something, feel free to point it out down there, and I sure hope that you enjoyed. I will see you in the very next Beyond All Reason video. Peace out, folks.